I'd like to start by saying thank you for coming along tonight for our session on the accessible genome. I'd also like to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Ghana people and to acknowledge their elders, past and present. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that this uh, event is made possible through the funding of the Australian Government, in particular the National Enabling Technologies Strategy. So I'd like, now like to introduce my panel. So we have um, three people who have very willingly um, come along tonight. So the first person is Jeanette Edson. Um, we met Jeanette earlier in the year because she um, bravely volunteered for I'm a Scientist to Get Me Out of Here and was actually the winner of the Lithium Zone, um, gathering the votes of hundreds of people who wanted to talk to her about DNA and hair and a whole lot of other discussions. So please join me in welcoming Jeanette. Um, our second guest is Dr Chris Slay. Dr. Dr Chris, I've called you Dr Chris because it seems like a Twitter thing to do. <laughs> Um, Chris also volunteered for I'm a Scientist Get Me Out of Here, which I said to him just goes to show that people who do that program get excited about communicating science to others, so we're very proud to have both of them here. Um, and Chris uh, also responded to one of my tweets which said, has anybody done a 23andMe um, personal genomics profile? And he had. Um, and he's also a, a medical researcher, so he can come at things from both angles. So please join me in welcoming Chris. And finally, our last guest, Professor Garrett Kuliti. 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 Yeah. I knew I was going to get that wrong. That's no. okay. <laughs> really appreciate you coming. Um, and I found Garrett through um, Jonathan Opie. We were on a um, singularity panel together um, during the Festival of Unpopular Culture. And I really appreciate Jonathan introducing us and, and really appreciate you being able to come here. It was important for me to have uh, a mixture of people who could talk about all of the different angles. So, so Garrett's going to bring us the ethical component. So we'll get started started straight away. What I've asked our um, guests to do is to give you a bit of a five minute backgrounder. Five minutes being, you know, euphemism for not too long, not too short, but something to give you a bit of background um, into why they're interested in this or what their professional capacity is to talk about it. So first of all, I'm going to ask Jeanette to talk a little bit about DNA, forensics and ancestry. Um, so as Kristen introduced, I'm based at the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA and I'm actually in my final year of my PhD. Um, and my research is forensic genetics. So I'm looking at developing methods for the recovery of human DNA from pieces of hair shaft. Um, when you hear the old story or the old saying, hair is dead, it really is. And um, despite hair being found very commonly at crime scenes, because of the way standard forensic typing works, we can't really use it um, as extensively as would be liked. So my role has been about looking at particularly this revolution that's been happening in, in genetic typing um, with the emergence of many types of new technology and then applying this to, to try and come up with a way to analyse the really degraded DNA that's found in, in human hair shaft. Um, as well as that, um, being part of the ancient DNA field, um, we do a lot of work at ACAD in relation to human ancestry, particularly typing of very ancient remains and also um, tackling not just hair but bones in relation to forensic investigation as well. For me, um, I guess in terms of the accessible genome, because we are in an age now where being able to sequence a human genome is becoming incredibly cheap um, and a very quick process. I mean, to give you an idea, um, the Human Genome Project, which published the first draft of the Human Genome back in I think it was 2001, um, took you know well over 10 years, several billion dollars. We're now in the age, in a space of you know a decade or so, that we can um, generate a human genome in as little as half a day. Um, and for you know, a couple of thousand dollars. For forensics in particular, we're seeing a shift. Um, the markers we usually use to identify people don't have a role to play and have been characterised um, as not being linked to disease um, or visible traits. Um, and recently, that's actually changed and we're starting to see a move towards the use of DNA to be able to identify how people look um, in forensic investigation and it's very applicable in the sense of if you have a very large suspect pool you don't want to have to sample hundreds and hundreds of people to get DNA profiles. Whereas if you can do a simple test that shows that the genetic mutations people carry, you know, the suspect had blue eyes, this person has blue eyes, you can rapidly direct an investigation. Of course, this raises many ethical questions. Um, it also raises several in terms of legislation. There's only one country in the world that can use this type of advanced technology at this stage, and that's the Netherlands. Um, and then, in regards to ancestry, also, we've had to deal with things like repatriation of remains and what people think when they find out where they're from, from a genetic sense as well. So, I think that... 
That is definitely something I want to explore when we get to our questions, because I think that issue about identity is a really, really interesting one. Chris, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit around um, the medical aspects of um, genomics. Sure, I will try. Um, <clears throat> so what I do for a living is I work on leukaemia. I'm a molecular biologist who does leukaemia research at Monash University. Um, <clears throat> I'm more of an old-fashioned biologist, I guess, in that my work principally centres around particular genes that I study rather than whole genomes. Um, so I don't have direct experience of uh, high throughput sequencing that Jeanette was speaking about that gives us the ability to generate a genome in half a day. But impact of such technology is going to impact on the field in which I work and already is, <clears throat> um, even though I don't do it myself. And so I'm, I'm aware of it and I am uh, not wary of it, that's the wrong word, but I'm I'm aware of it <clears throat> and uh, making sure that I stay abreast of the development so that I can um, uh, use it as it becomes available to me. So the impact that it's having so far is rather than, so someone gets leukaemia and that's a genetic disease, so it's created by genetic mutations. Um, so in the past, we didn't really have any way of quickly and rapidly identifying what those mutations were and uh, tailoring therapy along lines to target those specific mutations. And we still can't do that, but we're getting close. Once we can um, sequence a genome easily and cheaply, um, you'll be able to go to your doctor <coughs> and the doctor will say, oh, you have leukaemia, <coughs> let me take a sample and you'll give a sample and then the next day you'll have a list of all the mutations that have driven your leukaemia and with any luck, there will be therapies that are targeting those mutations and you'll be able to take the right pills that your doctor gives you and everything will be okay. That's the dream anyway. So that future is really not far away. All, that, all that's really holding it up is a little bit of economics at the moment. We just need the technology to get that bit cheaper and more available. And having your genome, or at least having your cancer genome sequenced by your doctor will become a, a routine um, phenomenon. Um, so, going along with that though, there's, there's other diseases that are also impacted by the genome obviously, and most of those occur in your uh, somatic cells rather than your cancer cells, so they're not mutations that arise during your life, they're mutations that you're born with, and they're mutations that predispose you to develop a disease at a later time in your life. And the research into those diseases is also being heavily impacted by uh, this technology because the ability to sequence the entire genome of a large group of people means that you can take a group of people with a disease and a group of people without a disease, sequence their genomes and see what differences, basically what differences arise between those two groups and then you can go off and do your molecular biology to demonstrate that that mutation is actually causative of that disease. So that's how it's affecting research of rare diseases and uh, the diagnostic impact of it, at least as far as cancer goes. I guess if you're diagnosed with any other um, genetic disease in the future as well, I guess that will be easier by um, having a genome sequence when you go to the doctor, but I think the impact of it on uh, somatic diseases like that is more in the research area than it is in the diagnostic area. I think I've probably exceeded my five minutes. <laughs> no, that was a really good introduction because I was hoping to get that taste of um, both that diagnostic capability but also the personalised medicine response. Garrett, mm. ethical issues. What are, yeah. what are the key things that we need to be thinking about? Okay, so I'm a philosopher. I, I teach um, ethics to uh, undergraduates at, at the University of Adelaide. Um, I also actually chair the ethics committee. So. Some of uh, your uh, <laughs> applications <laughs> may have come past, <laughs> past my, my committee. Um, okay, so I, th I thought in my five minutes, um, I've just mentioned four broad kinds of, of uh, issues that arise. Um, and I must say that I myself don't particularly have an axe to grind on, on this question. Um, and if you thought about the three reasons why you might uh, want to uh, pay to, to get your genome sequenced, um, I suppose broadly speaking, they'd be for therapeutic type reasons, as, as Chris was mentioning. Um, uh, enhancement type uh, questions, which, which may arise as possibilities in the future of 
of tweaking your genome and perfecting yourself or, or others in some way. Um, and then the third one's just curiosity. Uh, and I, th I think I would put myself in that third category as someone who would be a candidate to fork out a few hundred dollars just, just in order to have that information about myself. Um, and I think in thinking about this ethically, you start off uh, just with the thought that if I wanted to know about my own family history, um, uh, I should be entitled to um, conduct some financial transaction with someone who's going to provide me with that information. Um, if the information's there, it's information about me, why shouldn't I be able to, to pay to have it? Um, and I guess uh, of the four kinds of uh, questions that arise, the first one is a question for information providers. Um, so if we look at the, the kinds of multifactorial uh, health conditions um, that uh, may be in the, in the ballpark that Chris was talking about before, um, uh, how, if you're um, giving someone counselling about the potential implications of finding this information out about themselves, how can you actually communicate that in a way that's understandable and digestible? If you said you've got a 30% chance of, of developing severe asthma depending on these environmental factors, although, uh, again, it also depends on the other genetic factors that might be present. Um, if, if the information is accurate enough, it ceases to be usable. Um, and one concern people have is with the use of this in prenatal screening. Um, so there's an issue for information providers. Second one for family members. Um, if I gain information about myself, uh, then potentially I know something uh, about my brothers and sisters, close, close relatives, children. Um, I have various rights over um, my kids. I can decide on their education, for example. Um, should I be able to have the right to find out their genome, uh, to pay to, to get my kids' genome sequenced and then get that information about them? So the second thing is about family. The third one, I think people have some anxieties about society generally. Um, suppose we all got it into our heads that there was some part of uh, our genome that's, that's shared, um, which is potentially detrimental to us. We all autonomously, individually excised it. Um, might there not be some, some, some uh, elements of the human gene pool that are, that are actually useful? and uh, we wouldn't want to get rid of. Um, and uh, finally, I think the sorts of concerns that people have are concerns for individuals, and individual virtue, if, if you will. Um, so at the moment, we try and educate ourselves to be fairly tolerant of imperfections. Um, uh, is that something that's going to be put under pressure in the future? Um, also, it seems that throughout uh, human history, there's a, a, a kind of meme, if you like, or a tendency uh, to think of our fate as being determined. We're, we're primed towards thinking about destiny, or thinking fatalistically. Um, and there's a, there's a danger for us that um, uh, that tendency can be encouraged just by thinking, well, it's, it's all in my genes. My, my genome gives my, my destiny for the future. Um, now, I don't think any of those are reasons for uh, wanting to very heavy-handedly prevent people from accessing this uh, information, but um, those seems to me some of the things we could talk about. And that's actually given me a great little scaffold to hang off some of the discussion. So the first thing I wanted to do was go back to, back to Chris about the experience in doing the 23andMe test and, and ask you whether you now feel your path is destined in right. any way. Well, <clears throat> so I did my 23andMe profile about, I think, 18 months ago. Does, does everybody know what a 23andMe <coughs> profile is? I just realised that that's just... I will. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I'll Can explain, you explain that. that? Um, so it's actually not genome sequencing. What they do is they send you a little sample cup and you fill the cup to the line with spit, which is the, <laughs> the best 10 minutes I've ever spent. <laughs> How spit. tall is the line? <laughs> It's, it's about it's quite a lot. Five minutes of spit. Yeah. They say just uh, swish it around your cheeks a bit to get lots of buckle cells in there and spit in the cup. So anyway, that was fun. Um, so you send that off to California, and they will 
not sequence it, but they'll extract your DNA and they'll run it on an array, which is similar to sequencing, but it only assesses certain data points in the genome. So it doesn't give you the full genome sequence, but it just assesses certain points of interest where um, there are differences that have been discovered which relate to a disease phenotype or a, a, another phenotype. So where I might have an A in my genome, Jeanette might have a G, and that might predispose one or the other of us to male pattern baldness. <laughs> <laughs> and so they will assess that data point, and I think it's something like 20,000 data points across the genome, I'm not sure about the number. And they'll assess that, <clears throat> uh, run it through their algorithm, and make a profile for you online. And then you can log into your profile about two weeks later, and you can look at your uh, differential disease prediction based on your genome. You can look at some ancestry data based on your genome, and you can um, try and find relatives um, who have also had their profile done and have similar matches to you, which is an aspect of it that I found very interesting. Um, <clears throat> so, with respect to uh, disease prediction, um, I found it to be not all that informative uh, and I think the reason for that is just that the studies aren't that that definitive in what they conclude so they'll they'll run <coughs> your DNA against an array and they'll pick out a point and they'll say oh this gives you a 1.5 fold increased risk for prostate cancer which is actually the the highest increased risk that I have is for prostate cancer according to them and so the average male risk for prostate cancer, according to 23andMe, is 16%. And my risk is something like 28%, which is less than double. So it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's 28%, which is not great. But it's still, you know, it's, it's better than one in three. I'm not definitely going to get prostate cancer. And even if I was, I would have a one in six chance of getting prostate cancer, even without that. So. <clears throat> the the power that the test provides to prediction at the moment at least is not that great <clears throat> so if you're looking to do a 23andMe profile to work out what's going to kill you it's probably not the best idea it's not going to tell you exactly what's going to happen to you health wise in the future it's just not that powerful part of the reason for that is that more work needs to be done like these studies that show correlation between SNPs, which are what the data points are called, SNPs. Uh, the correlation between that and a given phenotype is just, it's at a very early stage. We need more genome sequence than more data points to work out exactly what's going on. And the other part of it is that, as Garrett was saying, the genome just doesn't tell you the whole story and there are environmental factors that weigh into any disease as well. You can have the best lung cancer predicting genotype in the world, but if you smoke, you're still going to get it, I would say, I don't have that visual, but I would still not smoke even if I had a great prediction for lung cancer. So that's the, the disease prediction, maybe I could talk about the ancestry aspect of yeah, it. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so, so like any website these days, they're trying to create a little community, everyone's into social networking, and <coughs> so the 23andMe's way of doing it is by having a function called relative finder where you can click a button basically and it comes up with a list of people who it predicts you might be related to. The people are all hidden from you, you can't see their names, you can't see any information about them except what they choose to display publicly. Um, but you have a, an option to contact them and ask them if they'll share their information with you. And so I've <coughs> spent a fair bit of time doing that because I'm into social networking as well. <coughs> and I've I've made contact with a few people who, uh, <clears throat> so we've communicated back and forth and we haven't really been able to work out whether, or not whether, we haven't been able to work out where we are actually related. We've traced our family trees back to try and work out where they overlap. The closest I got was a girl who lives in Germany and had an ancestor in New Zealand with the same name as one of my ancestors who emigrated from England to Australia in 1860. And we think they were sisters, but we can't go back a generation to confirm that they were sisters. But we nearly got there. So that was frustrating. But apart from that, I haven't really come close uh, in finding anyone. And I think the reason for that is just that there aren't that many people in Australia who have done it. And there aren't that many people worldwide who have done it. And most of the people who have, have had a profile done are in America. And I don't have any American ancestry that I know of. So I think that's limiting my ability to meet people um, in that way. But I think. 
a, a tool like that is very powerful if you're interested in your recent ancestry, um, not ancestry so much, your recent family tree, if you're interested in meeting people who you are distantly related to, I think it's a great idea. Um, there are obviously privacy implications that arise, but everything on the website is controlled so that you only show as much information as you want to show and you only accept contact from people that you want to accept contact from and if you at some later point decide to withdraw contact you are quite free to do that so it's about as safe as it could be um, to share your information with people online. Yeah, so there's a couple of things I wanted to raise. So one of those things is the safety of, of when you've got all your data and it is online, how safe do you feel with your with your data sitting there, I think that's worth sort of thinking about. The other thing that you've talked about is, is both in terms of the disease prediction and in terms of the ancestry. The limitations seem to be limits of, of the research and limits of the data that's available. So I think that's also one thing I'd like to kind of get our heads around during the discussions at least, if not through, through your Q&A, is how, how might things evolve when those limitations are no longer, you know, no longer in place, when there's enough data to be able to actually look at much um, much greater disease prediction and a lot more data about ancestry, which leads me to you. Because I was really interested when you said, you know, the, the issues of people finding out where they're actually from, you know, some of those issues. Um, ancestry is quite an interesting topic because uh, to me, having worked with the guys I work with, there's almost different levels. So you, you talk about the family tree, so that, that's your second and third cousins, you know, grain up, Mildred, that sort of thing. And what's interesting is my lab is part of the National um, Demographic Project which aims to even go further back in time. And this is not just, you know, second or third cousins or if you're related to the Queen, but migration out of Africa type thing. Um, and I think that raises interesting questions as well, not just if you are related to someone in particular or family tree, but, you know, for someone, um, there's a funny story actually about James Watson, who, you know, grandfather of DNA, he helped elucidate the structure of DNA. Um, and he said some nasty things about African people, and when they sequenced his genome, it turned out he had quite a bit of African ancestry in him. And he's now gone very quiet on the subject. <laughs> so it can be, it's, it comes back to the curiosity thing. You know, I, as part of contamination control in our lab, I've had my, my DNA typed, and you know, find out you're not what you think you are um, is really interesting to the curiosity, curiosity aspect. But there is some sort of sinister aspects as well. Um, there's the fact that recently, we were, we were talking about this just earlier, um, this Hungarian Minister of Parliament had his DNA typed to prove that he was pure of Jewish and um, Gypsy DNA. So despite the fact we can use our knowledge and our power of the genome to figure out you know, how people migrated out of Africa or where people are from or how geographic barriers have, have changed our genome or you know, if you're in a high altitude versus low altitude, there's, there's a multitude of questions. Um, it can actually go the other way as well, which to me is, is a bit of a concern. To go back to um, the immediate relatives, actually, I should mention family tree DNA might be worth checking out if you're interested in, in ancestry because they do have a, a massive database. So family tree DNA was set up as part, I think they have ties to ancestry.com, if there's anyone who knows about ancestry.com. So if you are interested in tracing your family heritage, you can actually get them to do your DNA, and they specialise just in figuring out who your fifth cousin and that sort of thing. Are. Um, but what's really happened recently in forensics is there's some policy going on in the in California, I think it is in the US, where um, we've got a case of someone's committed a crime and they have the relative's DNA on the database. And this is actually known as familiar database matching. And there's a push to actually allow under law that if we have your brother's DNA, we can actually use that to determine if you're at the crime scene. So there's actually issues around is that acceptable? Um, and how reliable it is as well, because if you have a brother, you only share half of your, or even a quarter of your genetic information. So um, the actual use of ancestry and forensics is playing a big role as well. Um, and the same goes again for the concept of race. And it has to be stated that biologists, officially, there is no thing, such thing scientifically as race. But when you start talking about ancestry, it can raise some interesting questions about um, if well, again to go back to the negative side of things that people could actually play into and say well that proves race exists well it doesn't um, it proves that at one time one of your ancestors 10,000 years ago you know, was on this side of a, of a mountain and this side they were on you know the rest of them were on the other side so it's 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 more about um, 
human migration and, and that sort of thing, and not the fact that we're saying, you know, your ration is pure compared to some other person. So, and that, that to me worries me a little bit that recently there's been these stories in the media, um, because that's not how I would like to see the good work into evolutionary biology um, being used. Is, is that one of the issues that we is that a, is that one of the issues that sends uh, black folks off you, or is that a different? Yeah, issue? well, I, I think one a range of these issues are, are kind of common elsewhere. Um, so, what, one of the things that um, some people are concerned about is discrimination um, in relation to things like health insurance. Um, but that, that's not really specific to having your your uh, genome done, um, because the the more uh, specific health information we're able to gather on people, the more opportunity there is to, to say, well, you're a bigger health risk than, than someone else. But the, the issues that I, I think are particularly tricky here are the ones about sharing information with other relatives. So, so that once we operate just with a, a model of complete autonomy, that I'm able to make decisions for myself, and I don't have to ask the permission of my relatives to do that. Um, well, they may be impacted uh, by the decisions I'm making, uh, uh, supposedly on my own behalf. Um, and another thing that that's people have raised as a prospect for the future um, is that where Chris was talking about um, having uh, particular, say, pharmacological interventions that are um, targeted at specific uh, genotypes in individuals, um, People are raising the prospect that um, with expensive drugs in the future, you might actually have to have your uh, genome sequenced in order to uh, get access to those, those drugs, uh, in, in order not to waste them, um, if we're, to make sure that the drug will be effective. Yeah, so effective time. Yeah, for, for you. Um, now that's, that's a, a prospect for the future that um, uh, you know, hasn't arisen yet, but um, that, that's the flip side. Where you might think, well, at least I'm, I'm entitled not to my uh, genetic information divulged. Well, particularly in a, in a society where we have public uh, funding for medicines, it's not entirely unreasonable to say uh, we ought to be able to find out whether this is going to work for you before um, providing it. And that sort of brings us back to your, your raising prenatal screening yeah. as well, because yeah. we're already having the debate around. Um, gender screening and the impact on decision making where that's not regulated for instance. Lots of stories around Pakistan for instance and generations of missing women. But, but I guess that's one of the things that concerns me when we're testing for a full range of qualities which could be hair colour, eye colour, um, a disease profile, um, a, a tendency towards anxiety or depression or any right. of those things. And the, the diseases could be anything. So, um, you know, 10% Elevated uh, predisposition towards asthma. So suppose you, you found that out um, either uh, after conception or, or before implantation in, in a, um, uh, an IVF context. Um, would, would we regard that as a, an acceptable basis on which to be making decisions about whether to continue with pregnancy? I'm, I'm going to open it to people. Um, we just going to move the cameras around a little bit so I can. Can come and walk around and gather your questions, but it also gives you a bit of time to um, talk to the person sitting next to you and start to think about the types of things that you'd really like to follow up. So, um, I mean, I think the things that are coming through for me are, are some of those ethical question, questions that are things that we're already grappling with, or, or what are the new ones that we might need to grapple with. Um, I think this issue of identity is a really, really good one, and I think there's a couple of things that have come out. There's that issue of um, destiny. Um, you know, so where am I going in the future and is my future controlled by the gene profile that I have and how that interacts with the environment? Um, and is it also controlled by the past that I bring? And if my past is different to the stories my family has told me, how does that affect the way that I see myself in the future? I think that's really, really interesting. And I think this whole issue of um, adjusting uh, a diagnostics and medical treatment to, to who we are and how we are is, is really interesting, but also then how we and we're already grappling, I think, with what we count as disease versus normal in some in some aspects or lots of variants. So those are the sorts of things that come to mind in terms of hearing the three of you talk. So we'll just take a like a two-minute break. I guess I'm just curious as to first mentioned the genetic test that you encountered. I'm just wondering how much that costs and if your daughter 
I actually got a copy of the results. I would never give my doctor a copy of the results. No, <laughs> no that's not true actually. I, I wouldn't mind if my doctor had a copy, but there's no way they can access it. Uh, at the moment, there's no direct pathway between 23 and me and the, the doctor, so there's no relationship there, and they would have to go through me to get it. Uh, the answer to how much it costs, we were talking about just before, I think, so I did it 18 months ago, and I think it was something like $300, maybe $400. Now I believe you can do the same, actually a better test, for $99. So even the cost of that is coming dramatically down, and that reflects the, the advance in technology that parallels the advance that Jeanette was speaking about that's allowing us to actually sequence the genome uh, quickly. So yeah, the, the price is dropping and it's very, well, $99 is not cheap, but it's, it's relatively affordable. I think the data that we were talking about was a, sorry, a graph which is indicating that it will be below 1000 by the end of the year for the whole genome as opposed to just those traits. Yeah, so, so again, if the price comes down as fast, it, it's, very, it's I guess that's why we call it accessible, because it's not far off. That's the benchmark people have set to say this is now affordable and economically viable way of, uh, especially medically. Uh, it's Once it gets below $1,000, it becomes viable as a medical tool. So once it gets there, it could really take off. but that's going to sound like a long winded question, but I think I need to give some background. Um, a little while ago, I was um, listening to something on Radio National, and they were talking about rethinking the use of MRI tests as a diagnostic tool, um, because they were finding there was a lot of things that you were finding, that results that you were finding in people um, that were non-clinical defects. So, for instance, if you do an MRI scan of the average 50-year-old's uh, knee, even if they've got no nothing wrong with their knee, you'll find things like torn cartilage and such like. And they'll be thinking the idea of MRIs as a general diagnostic tool because you're finding things wrong with people that aren't actually clinically presenting and it's creating a lot of false positives. Uh, Chris, when you were talking about genomic diagnostics, I was thinking very much the same thing as far as are we finding things in people that actually aren't going to clinically present themselves and how, long is, how big a data set are we going to need before we know how many false positives there are? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the, I mean, obviously, if you sequence someone's genome, you're going to find a lot of stuff that is not necessarily what you're looking for. You'll find a ton of information, and not all of it will be relevant to whatever the reason is that you're sequencing. And a lot of it won't be relevant medically at all. Um, a lot of it. So you could worry about it from the sensitivity to race that Jeanette was speaking about. Um, because that's not medically relevant, but it's something you can determine about a person by having that information. So. That is definitely a concern. Um, so with respect to knowing how much data you need before you can determine if something is important, it's really dependent on the specific case that you're talking about. Um, I was trying to prepare for this the best I could and I read, I read some cases where they've uh, taken a number of uh, relatively simple genetic disorders that are mostly caused by a single, or well, thought to be simply inherited, so caused by a single locus in the genome. And there's about 10 or 12 of these cases that have now been fully solved thanks to high throughput genome sequencing. And those cases were done in relatively small groups of people. They had maybe four affected cases and 10 unaffected cases. And from that data, they were able to identify the particular point that was responsible for that disease. So in some cases it doesn't take a lot of data, but for other cases, if you're looking at uh, character traits, not character traits, phenotype traits that are multifactorial, so not just dependent on one single DNA base pair, one single locus in the genome, then you really are going to need a lot of data to say anything useful about that at all. So, you know, I think one of the big questions to me about the accessibility of the genome is when we sequence people's genomes medically, does that information become available to the medical community to make further findings from? Because that's where the power is going to be when we have access to everyone's genome and we can access it at a large level. That's where the statistical power to make those sort of connections between multifactorial diseases and phenotypes is really going to be powerful. But there's obviously privacy issues with that. And so I think that's one of the major questions. I would like to see the data made available but I think I'm coming at it from a slightly biased perspective and I think the society at large probably prefer the opposite. Mm -hmm.
Mm. The, there is actually a way of doing that, which, which I suppose the epidemiological research community is, is moving towards, which is to have very large data sets um, and then a mechanism for taking the identifiers off the individual bits of data. And I, I, I think um, it's, it's pretty unreasonable, actually, uh, for, for me if um, my personal identifiers have been removed from my health information, then to object to that being pulled in such a way that people can actually find out significant things and, and help people. So that, that's, that's, I think, pretty, pretty clearly the way that yeah. it's desirable to go, but it's having a mechanism to actually make that work that's a bit tricky. So I, I agree with you that that's a, a reasonable compromise, and I think it's probably the way things will progress. But I think that doing that limits the usefulness of the data because in order to make... So what I'm talking about is having everyone's genome available. And if you, if you have everyone's genome available and you can trace that back to each individual and learn uh, you know, phenotypic traits about each person, then obviously you can ask any question you like. If you are limited in what you know about the individuals that provide the data, then it limits what you can do. So I think you're right, I think that's what will happen. But I think it's not, I mean, maybe it is the best solution, but it's not the best research solution. Yeah, um, it's going to be a question, as you suggest, of what you combine it with. Um, so the, the question is how to, to um, link different data sets without actually um, revealing to the, the people who are doing the linking the identity of the individual. So, so if you have all, all of the other phenotypic information that's in the health system, yeah. Um, I mean, you can almost combine potentially an extensive do. survey and yeah. have people answer every question imaginable about themselves and maybe that would be a good solution. I actually think 23andMe, that's what they did because 23andMe have used some of the data, like, you know, let's say people like Chris have sent in, they obviously would have had to have sought permission and they, they looked at risk factors for, I think there was schizophrenia and a few other things that they published. So I think definitely the groups that are collecting this data are trying to figure out um, how best to enable researchers to get access to it or to utilise it in other ways as well. And so I think it, it'll also come down to how researchers or, or the groups that sit on all this data market it to the, the people or the volunteers or the people who provide it as well, that if you can show it, it's going to be used to advance what we know medically and help treat people. I think that's quite appealing, um, personally, you know, if I know. So the, the way that 23andMe does that is they, they take the data that they have about you and then they ask you to participate in research studies. So they have a bunch of surveys up on their website and they just ask you to go and take them and before you take them you have to sign over permission to mm -hmm. use the data in a research study and then you just answer questions about whether you're good at sport or what your favourite colour is or whatever. Yeah. And then they try and correlate that from 10,000 people to things in the, in the genome. Um, so yeah, so there is privacy associated with that and you have to grant permission before they go ahead and do it. And I think that's probably the way forward. Another question? I'm looking at this side of the room because we've had one and that table one excellent one. What privacy mechanisms were in place before you actually took that test? Um, I mean, I know it'd be pretty hard to get 200 mils of your friend's spit, but you know, if you so wanted, could you have sent off somebody else's product for testing? That's a good question. I hadn't thought about that. If you could get someone else's spit, um, After a big night. <laughs> there are situations where you can imagine what happened. Um, yeah, I don't see any reason. I don't think there was anything I did that required me to prove that I was who I said I was. So I think I probably could have sent, you know, my family or my wife or anyone that I wanted to. I probably could have submitted a sample as them and 23 of me would have been otherwise. That's a great question. And it's just maybe something's going to get yeah. easier, so you won't actually need half a cup of spit. It will get down to, you know, maybe a fingernail or something. Yeah, I mean, they don't really need the cup of spit to do it. I think now we can do it with uh, cotton swabs from the inside of the mouth. So you really don't need that big a sample to do it. So you, that is a major concern if you can get someone's sample and submit it, pretending that you're there, and attach your email address to it and get the results, then, you yeah, know, that is, that is a concern. I don't know, I don't have a solution to that. I don't, don't see any way around it. You're sitting on a question, I think. I'm sure it's going to come out right. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
clearly there are going to be good genes and bad genes and genes people want and people don't want. Are we at risk of creating sort of like a class system based around what genetics you've got and what that will mean for future societies and what that means for people who can afford to do it, people who can't afford to do it? So a little bit like Gattaca. Yeah, I, that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a really good question as well. I, I don't think from a scientific point of view we're at the stage of being able to like engineer or, or select um, for things aside from the likes of gender or sex, sorry. Um, cool. Um, I don't like talking about the negatives, but that, that is something that I've, you know, to go back to the, the concept of race and ancestry as well, um, that we actually are sort of seeing small examples of that um, and you know, from an ethical point of view, do we allow selection of intelligence? Should there come out that we can select for intelligence through the genetic, through genes? Um, yeah, I don't know what you guys think from a more ethical point yeah, of view. Yeah, well, it's, it's a prospect for the future, for yeah. sure. Um, so, uh, you know, j just as you can choose who to hang around with um, on the basis of looks or intelligence or, or something completely, you know, frivolous, um, uh, if um, each of us chooses um, only to uh, have a partner with whom we we'll have children on the basis of, say, physical characteristics. Um, why couldn't we, just in terms of our own in individual entitlements, say, if the technology is available, um, I want to, to do this. Um, and I think you, you have to think, just from the way in which human beings operate, that um, status kind of comparisons between us are going to drive us just as we pay a lot of attention to the badge on someone's car um, to pay attention to that in the future if, if it's if it's possible for us um, you know, why didn't i have the um, uh, genetic screening done and, and, and do the tweaking um, if, if it were available um, if that does become available in the future yeah. and if we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years, um, presumably it will be. If we're talking about you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, um, presumably it will be. That, that, that is a prospect for the future. I think though that that's, so you mentioned that we're free to associate with whoever we want and so on, and that's true, but as far as the governments are concerned and so on, we're all treated equally, mm. at least most of us are. So, so there has to be that level of legislative support to to not discriminate against someone based on their genes. So it's it's one thing to do it on a personal level, but at a societal level, it's... Absolutely. Similar. Yeah, no, that, that's right. So there does come a point where we can all um, uh, claim an entitlement to step in and say that um, our exercise of our freedom should be regulated just for the benefit of everyone. Um, and this, I think, is one of those issues where it's, it's going to be legitimate for us as a society to legislate. Um, but I guess uh, Chris's experience already shows that it's all very well people in Australia setting up a, a set of rules surrounding uh, the use of uh, genetic information. Um, but if you can get it over the internet from, from the US, uh, there's, there's relatively little we can do in this country uh, really to, to regulate um, people's international actions. I've been reading the book um, My Beautiful Genome in preparation for this and there's a really interesting part where she talks about getting her genome sequenced and looking for certain pairs and almost like a real relief or an excitement when certain things are proven. Oh, of course I've got that pair, that's just what I'm like and I, I think that's a really interesting part of that, you know, that identity or that yes, I identify with that characteristic and therefore it's important for me to have that type of um, genetic sequence. And when we've got the whole genome in front of us and it's like a, almost like a, that type of um, genetic sequence. And when we've got the whole genome in front of us and it's like a, almost like our photograph of, of biologically who we are, how we might claim ownership of some of those things that then reinforce the way that we behave or, 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 or we you know, stress different things based on that knowledge. I think that's also interesting as well. I mean, you call it a photograph, you could almost call it a horoscope as well. You know, you get those generic personality describers and you say, oh yeah, that's exactly what I'm like. So it's kind of like, are we just using confirmation bias in what we're seeing? Is it, you know, is it really who we are or are we just choosing to see what we want to see?
my 23 and me profile predicted male pattern baldness. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I identify with that. <laughs> and I think it's actually a really nice place for us to at least pause the Q&A and um, have some discussions over drinks. So as I said, please feel free to fill in the, the forms as, as things come up and um, feel free to tweet bits and we'll capture all of that as well. Really, really appreciated you coming out when everyone's got the flu, it's the end of the financial year um, and it's raining out there. So that's very much appreciated. And I'd like you to thank our panelists, Jeanette, Chris and Garrett. Thank you very, very much.